First, the numbers. What are they? Why are they a big deal now? And what do our education officials think of them? Here's Matt Pearl. I have been concerned about that for a very long time. These numbers are a surprise. The numbers first emerged in April. Georgia's graduation rate 67 percent, a big step down from rates of the past. The numbers got even worse in some of Metro Atlanta's biggest districts. DeKalb County, Clayton County, Marietta, Gainesville, and Atlanta, all in the 50s. The U.S. Department of Education released graduation rates for each state today. The numbers for nearly every state released side by side this week. Georgia ranked 44th in the country, the lowest graduation rate in the southeast. If we were ranked number one in the country, we wouldn't be happy with 67%. So the rankings, yes, they're important, but I'm looking at students and who's graduating and who's not. Clearly, there is a lot to talk about here. Also joining me here in the studio this evening is Neil Shorthouse, co-founder of Communities in Schools. That's a program designed to keep otherwise struggling students in school through to graduation. Dwight Kelly, next to him, president of 100 Black Men of North Metro, an organization that offers several mentoring programs in schools. And, of course, our own uh, education reporter, Donna Lowry. So I I'm trying to put these numbers in perspective, as you know, trying to understand their importance. So, Mr. Shorthouse, House, let's start with you. In general, the graduation rate, is this a true and ultimate barometer, an ultimate indicator of the quality of education in a school system? Quick answer. No. We have the best elementary, middle, and high schools in the country somewhere in Georgia, and there's a lot of them. But it is true that we have a lot of failure, and we've got to get to that. It's an enormous problem, but it's a problem with a solution. Is this a crisis? And, and why should we care, especially if, if we don't have, or our viewers, uh, some of them don't have kids in public schools here in Georgia. Should we care? Yes, everybody pays for this. They pay for it in higher taxes. They pay for it in higher criminal justice and health care costs. This is an enormous problem. It's the biggest moral, ethical, and economic challenge we have in Georgia. You, you, we have to connect with kids, and that sounds simple, but a lot of children, as Dr. Barge said, are not connecting with the schools. Programs don't change kids, relationships do. Mm. And we have got to be unrelenting in our commitment to develop high quality personal relationships with children and to tell them that this job that you have called school is your number one priority and we're here as a relational change agent with you to enable you to succeed. So coming up next, you're going to meet some students once on the edge, but are now re-engaged in their education. Back in a moment. about the problem from adults, but what do teenagers have to say? Our Kids in Schools reporter, Don Lowry, talked to a few students. Yeah, I did. I spoke to teens who've considered dropping out. They hated school, felt bored, lost, invisible in some cases, until they enrolled in a program they feel really focuses on them as individuals. In the high school setting, it, it's very, it tends to be very overwhelming. It's why she and the others here admit at various times in the past they considered quitting. I wanted to drop out a few times. I was like, no, I don't have no support. You know, you just like start thinking about should I be in class, be bored, or just go hang out with my friends and have fun. It's so crowded at the high school. Like for me, it was just there was too many people, too big of classes to where I didn't feel like going to class. It was like I was just a number. You know, I was just another. Uh, just another student, just another person they're trying to get graduated. They admit they either struggled in school or just didn't care, yet they're all still working to get diplomas. They've left their home school and are enrolled in a dropout prevention program run by communities and schools. The classes are smaller, the attention more focused. The teachers help you out more, like they pay attention more to you. The work, you know, hey, it might get tough. That's what the support comes in. You need the support to drive you to do the work. And here I've done a lot more in two years and three years at the high school. It's a more personal, up close, you know, let's, hey, let's get you, Molly, graduated. Really? Instead of just, well, you know, there's another kid. Because, you know, every kid has the option to drop out. You know, once you hit 16, it's really on you. But here it's like, you know, they don't want you to drop out, you know, because it's almost like, you know, they'd be losing a family member. 
Mr. Shorthouse, back to you. First of all, kudos to communities and schools. Uh, it's, it's working in, in many instances for those young people and many more. Would it make a difference if the personal dropout age were raised from 16 to 18? I think so, and uh, I certainly think it would go, the dropout rate would go up if we dropped it to 14. <laughs> so nobody's talking about dropping it to 14. No, please, heavens no. <laughs> Absolutely. So we need to raise it because it gives parents a, 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 a piece of power. The child can't say, well, the law says I only have to go to 16. This gives a parent a bargaining chip with their child, and not maybe that parents should have that, but this is the way it needs to be. It needs to, we need to have the expectation children are going to go to school through 18. I, so should a solution, any solution, all solutions, should they be multi-pronged? Yep. Absolutely, and certainly the parents are a key piece of this. Parents are the most important and most influential person in anybody's life. Even I'm wondering what the questions I had to ask my mother, who's been dead 22 years. Uh, without a parent involved, a child is not going to be successful in a large number of cases. But the good news is, many parents who we consider to be sorry, poor, uh, maybe even in, in difficulty, if they're asked the question, what's your goals for your child, they've got them. And so what we need to do is ask them that question and follow up, well, how can we be a part of the solution for that? And that's going to mean more, more things for teachers to do, but we believe that we can't load much more on teachers. Yeah. We need to get more people in the community a part of that. That's why we call our organization Communities in Schools. Volunteers, many people can be engaged in this. You don't have we, to be a parent. Absolutely not, officially. but, but, but we, we, we place a lot of value on those parents because we think they're the, the pace setter for their child. Or perhaps we're all parents, huh? And, and sometimes the parents need what you guys give them, and that is role models. They need to know how to parent. They don't know what they need to do to help their children. And sometimes these both organizations, uh, both communities and schools and 100 black men, they work to help parents. Communities in Schools of Georgia has provided extensive resources for parents and caregivers that can help you with giving that guidance that children so desperately need to succeed in school. Their goal, as ours, is to support youth, greatly improve graduation rates and academic achievement, and post-secondary school readiness.